42. Each of these discussions is intended to be of some immediate value to the listener's market operations, and hopefully will continue to be of value in the, in the future. To fulfill this goal, we try to pay close attention to the questions and problems brought to us for explanation, clarification, or some other type of assistance. The reason is that for every student who admits to a certain problem or misunderstanding, there is likely to be many more that do not. Therefore, if we make an effort to help that one student by way of these discussions, hopefully a benefit will be derived by many more. For those for whom the particular point under consideration is not a problem, the discussion can act as a reinforcement. The value of reinforcement in the learning process should never be underestimated. In the stock market, it is especially critical because even a momentary lapse of memory can be costly. Occasionally, we hit upon a topic that generates a particularly positive response. That was the case with the last discussion. What was the topic of that tape? To be perfectly honest, we didn't have one. Rather, it had more of a theme, which could be stated as what I did and why. We could also say that there was a second theme, which might be stated as why, what I did, did or did not work out. This tended to make that discussion more personal than most, and that is perhaps what brought out the positive response. Listeners could see themselves reflected in the actions of others. Somehow this type of lesson seems to leave a deeper impression. In an effort to burn that image still deeper, we will repeat the process this time. Let's begin by taking a look at the exam that accompanied the last tape. After a year of these exams, it seems that most everyone is becoming so observant that we are unable to make the questions as difficult as actual mark operations can be. This is a good sign. Sometimes, though, the responses we get do warrant a comment or two, and this is one of those times. First, we will consider some of the responses given by a relatively new student, which most of you who are listening to this tape are not. Even so, there is a tendency for even the most experienced student to occasionally behave like a novice. The idea is to keep these to a minimum. Perhaps a look at some of his answers will help in this effort. Question number two, which was one of the true or false questions, reads as follows. The option trader who cannot or will not make use of mental stops should realize substantial profits. The answer to this is clearly false. Why? The trader who cannot or will not make use of such a stop is, in effect, trading without protection. The Wyckoff approach clearly states that an investor's first obligation is to protect his funds. Since we are all painfully aware that none of us is blessed with perfect judgment, trading without protection becomes a fool's game. The individual who does it should not expect to realize substantial profits. In fact, he should not expect to realize any at all. Okay, now we know the correct answer and why it is correct. Did our new student answer the question? Well, he really did not answer it. Instead, he crossed out the word should, changed it to could, and then answered it as being true. Could the option trader who refuses to impose a mental stop on himself realize substantial profits? The answer is obviously yes, so it has to be accepted. But that is not the point. Another fact of which we are all painfully aware is that in the market, or a stock, anything can happen. The question is, do you want to base your market actions on coulds or shoulds? We enter into a position with certain specific expectations. The stock should do this and or that. And if it does not, its reason for being is eliminated, or so should be the position. As soon as we let the word could enter our thinking, the door is open to accepting anything. If we take a position and things do not go as expected, but our response is to say that things can still work out, chances are that we will continue to say it until we lose everything. By always basing our actions on things that should happen, we can keep the odds in our favor, 
which is the best we can ever do. This new student hopefully will be able to mend his ways before his faulty approach takes most of his funds. Those who have been using the could approach instead of the should approach for a long time may have a harder time of it. It's a change that must be accomplished, however. Future profits depend on it. Now, let's move on to question 18, which reads as follows. A stock was bought at $25. Its objective was between 35 and 37. It is now at 36 and 1 8 and has been experience, experiencing an unusual increase in volume over the past three days. What additional condition might develop that, when combined with those already present, could cause an investor to sell this stock? What should he do while waiting for that additional correct condition? Here is the answer given by the same student whose answer to question two we were considering. He says, an automatic reaction could occur if price weakness exists. The investor should be aware of his mental stop and be ready to close out his position. There are two problems here. Let's deal with the smaller one first. He says that an automatic reaction could occur if price weakness exists. He has concluded that a buying climax is in progress, which is justifiable from the information given. However, he then says an automatic reaction could happen. This is wrong. Given a climax, the automatic reaction must happen. Did you detect the major problem with his answer? There were two words that should set off alarms and start red lights flashing in your mind. They are mental stop. In this question, we are dealing with a stock position. Therefore, there is no need for a mental stop, and there is no justification for one. With options, that is all that is available, so we have to use them. With stocks, however, there is no reason not to use the real thing. If this student really plans to use mental stock stops on his stock positions, he will be leaving his funds totally unprotected on every trade. If he adds this to his earlier answer, which also indicated an inclination towards not protecting himself, we see what may become a major problem for the student. It appears as though he is going to let the market do to him what it will. If so, his chances for survival in the market are limited. Recently, we have been stressing the keeping of detailed records and reasons. What we have learned from these two answers should point up the value in this. From the two responses, we found the makings of a potential major problem. Since it is only potential, hopefully it can and will be corrected before it becomes a real problem. In the keeping of records and reasons on actual market operations, we are not dealing with potential problems. They are all very real. Therefore, the need for corrective action is even more critical. The basis for this will be found in the records because the reasons for the problem will be permanently recorded there. Before we leave the exam, we should take a look at number 20, where there was an unacceptably high number of answers that were really wrong. The common error was to say that there was not enough information given to come to any conclusion. This is incorrect. The information provided allows for the making of a very important conclusion. What do we know? We know that the stocks had advanced from $20 to $30, or 50%. These two facts permit a conclusion that the stocks were stronger than the market. A stock that is stronger than the market should not be considered a prime short-selling candidate. The practice trading exercise asked us to determine what is going on in the market and what is likely to happen next. How are the stocks likely to respond? Is any immediate action warranted? What additional developments might result in a decision to take a position? These are all rather broad questions, so coming up with one set of answers that represent the only correct response is probably not possible or desirable. What we will do is to point out some of the more important points that should have been noted. The first question that should have been addressed is, what was going on in the market? The one answer that is undeniably true here 
is that the market was in a downtrend. That being true, we would not be looking to jump into a long position. Saying that the market was in a downtrend establishes the trend, but it should be remembered that this is only half of the first step of the Wyckoff method. The other half is to determine the position. In this case, that is especially important because it has a bearing on the likelihood of the downtrend continuing. If the trend is down, we should be thinking about selling short. However, if the position within that trend is precarious, we should be looking more for a change than a short selling opportunity. At point A, the market became extremely oversold. Its price and volume action indicate that there was even a potential selling climax. If that proves to be true, the oversold condition at A would prove to be the ultimate oversold condition. Either way, there should be a correction. This occurred on the rally back up to point B, which put the market back into its downtrend channel. This would seem to indicate the desirability of taking new short positions. In some cases, this would make sense, but in this case, it would be questionable. The reason is the conflicting possibility surrounding the market's position. Although it was back in the downtrend, the market had not reached the supply line. Therefore, a decision to sell short would have involved a relatively high degree of risk. There was also the fact that the market was coming off a potential selling climax. This would mean that the move from A to B would be the automatic rally and indicate the beginning of a change from one primary phase of market action to another. At point C, which is at the end of the chart, the market is still in a downtrend, but is very near to the oversold line of that trend. Therefore, short selling could not be considered. There is also the fact that the move from B to C represented the market's attempt to confirm the possibility of a climax at A. At the end of the chart, it appears as though the necessary confirmation was going to be given. Therefore, we have another reason to avoid short positions. Let's assume that we know for a fact that the last day in the chart is the bottom of a successful secondary test. That would tell us that the market had moved into a trading range. Should we then abandon the long downtrend and go long? The answer has to be no. There are a number of reasons for this. One is that the downward stride had not been broken. Consequently, we are left at the end of the chart with a market that is an, in an intermediate trend, but too poorly positioned within that trend to do any of the short selling that a downtrend would ordinarily suggest. If time permits later, we will look at this area from a shorter term perspective to see if some opportunities are present. The next question we need to look at is, what is likely to happen next? From the analysis already completed, we have reason to be confident about saying that nothing spectacular is likely to happen next. This conclusion can be made from our analysis of the market's position. If it is in a secondary test of a selling climax, we have no clear indication that the test is over. It has already passed the halfway point of the previous rally, but has not reached the level of the climax. Will the test stop here, or will it go a little further? It's really hard to say. Whichever is the case, the immediate future beyond that point is not likely to be especially spectacular either. The secondary test only confirms the trading range. There is still a testing and building process of undetermined length that will follow before an important new move can begin. If the market did, did not have a selling climax at A, but rather only a normal oversold condition, there is still no reason to be expecting anything spectacular. If the market continues to move lower, it will quickly become oversold again. This could result in another quick rally which might cause some excitement over the short term, but it would not be anything spectacular. The market could just turn around and start to rally again. This would be just a rally in a downtrend. Therefore, no matter which stance we take on the market's present action and probable next move, our conclusion is to immediate action should be the same, and it should be 
not to take any action. Having ruled out immediate action, the next step is to de determine what additional developments could create a situation that would warrant action. Before the market is going to be ready to resume the decline or replace it with an advance, there is probably going to have to be a more thorough development of the trading ranges between the levels of A and B. Trading ranges are where buying or selling tests are passed. The time to take action is after all nine of one or the other have been passed. At point C, this process has only just begun. The next thing to do is consider the individual stocks in light of the expectations for the general market. Stock number one is a good example of the conflicting pressures that can be imposed on an investor. First, he sees the count that developed prior to the important decline. He can also see that this count has now been worked out. Therefore, there is a good possibility that the decline is coming to an end. This seems to be confirmed by two additional facts. One is the oversold condition on the downtrend, which, when combined with the fulfilled downside objective, should make additional significant declines very difficult. The other important fact, or perhaps it would be best to call it an indication, is that of a selling climax suggested by the very high volume. In this case, it would seem as though there are no conflicting pressures. All the indications seem to point to the end of a decline, which should tell us to start thinking about long positions. There is more, however. Even though we have some signs that seem to indicate that the end of the decline is near, the stock is still in a downtrend. In addition, a new down count has developed near the end of the figure chart. Its objective is not at the level represented at the end of the chart, but about five points lower. This seems to say that after the immediate oversold position is corrected, the stock may resume its downtrend activity. Now we have a conflict. The best way to resolve it is with no immediate action. If a selling climax is occurring, there will have to be the development of a new trading range, which will take time and probably provide a variety of buying opportunities. If the stock is going to resume its downtrend, this fact should become evident by the character of the action that corrects the oversold condition. If the volume contracts as the price advances, and if the progress made on a day-to-day -day basis steadily declines, the probability of renewed downward movement is increased. It should be noted that the considerations given to this stock have been intermediate in nature. A shorter-term approach could result in different conclusions. We will come back to the shorter-term approach later. Stock number two has some characteristics similar to stock number one, but there are some important differences as well. The similarities begin with the fact that the stock is in a downtrend. Another important similarity is that the figure chart indicates that an important objective range has been reached. The important differences between this stock and stock number one centers around the position within the downtrend. The first stock had entered an oversold position when it reached its downside objective. Therefore, there was good reason to expect at least support, if not a rally. Stock number two, on the other hand, is positioned very near the middle of its downtrend channel. That should make it just as easy for the stock to decline as advance. The middle of a trend channel is not the place to take any action in most in instances. Stock number one appeared to be experiencing a selling climax as it became oversold. This provided extra support. What about stock number two? It seems to have high volume continuously which makes isolating a climax somewhat more difficult. However, look at point A. Here the volume is high, even for this stock, for a period of four days. Also note that there was a slight penetration of the oversold line at this point. If this is the climaxing of a down move, the position at the end of the chart represents a second secondary test and the first te test at which the volume was somewhat reduced. This stock is still a long ways from the point 
at which an intermediate position could or should be considered. If stock number three was only glanced at quickly, it might be confused with the picture of the general market. The two pictures are very similar. The stock provides a good example of what we mean when we say, pick stocks that are trading in harmony with the market. Since the stock is paralleling the market so closely, it should be easy to arrive at a conclusion as to the type of action that should be taken. The earlier conclusion about the market was that no immediate action could be justified. The same ho conclusion holds true for the stock. There is something about stock number three that should be noted that would tend to make it a likely candidate for a long position should developments continue to be positive beyond the end of the chart. Notice that as the market moved down from point B to point C, it was forced to give up more than half of the previous rally. This is not especially negative in this case. If A does represent a selling climax, it is not uncommon for the secondary test to return to the level of the climax. Still, it is not as perfect a situation as a normal halfway correction. Stock number three is in such a situation. It has managed to hold more than half of its previous gain. This is the first indication of relative strength. There may be more to follow. If so, the stock starts to become a candidate for a long position, but that is at some point in the future and not something that can be used as a reason for immediate action. Stock number four, like the other three, is a conflicting mix of indications. The most positive indication is that the downtrend is being broken. There were penetrations of the supply line at A and B, providing the warning of an impending break in the trend. At point C, the break appears to have occurred. This means that the move from that point to the end of the chart represents the effort to confirm the break. There is a problem here. We would normally expect this confirmation to be concluded near the low of the reaction between B and C. This would accomplish two things. It would confirm the break and help establish, establish a support level. We can see that this has not happened in this case. The stock was not supported where it should have been, and there is no clear indication that the break has been confirmed. In fact, at the very end of the chart, it appears as though the stock is poised to re-enter the downtrend channel. This would eliminate any possibility of confirming the break. A re-entering of the downtrend channel could signal a short-selling opportunity. Once the stock is recaptured by the trend, it should continue to move with it for a while and may move all the way to the bottom of the channel, where an oversold position could be established in preparation for another attempt to rally. This would seem to indicate a need for immediate action. However, the condition of the general market does not favor the taking of short positions. The stock may move directly to the bottom of its trading range and a good profit missed by not taking action. But the condition of the general market indicates that the odds are against this. Thus far, we have looked at the stocks only from an intermediate standpoint. What if our approach to the market is short-term in nature? How might this change things? Although no figure chart of the wave is provided, if one were, it would show an area of distribution around B, indicating an objective level a little lower than point C. That tells us not to expect too much additional downside progress. This is confirmed by the oversold condition of the technometer and, to a somewhat lesser degree, by the fact that the volume has not continued to move up as the price has gone down. Do we want to go in on the long side immediately? Probably not immediately, but likely soon. The reasons for not wanting to jump in immediately are the slightly lower objective and the continuing declines in the momentum and force. Waiting an additional day or two will give the market a chance to reach its objective and give the force and momentum an opportunity to begin a turn. Assuming this happens, which stocks would be the best candidates? What about stock number one? Since it is, in, 
since it is at an important downside objective and oversold, should it not be a candidate for a rally? It should be, but do we want to try participating in it? The answer is probably no. The reason is the relative weakness of the stock. It may rally, but the relative weakness of the stock should hold down the result of that rally from what it would be if the stock happened to be relatively strong. Stock number two has the same problem. Therefore, it should also experience difficulty rallying. In this case, there is evidence to support the idea. Notice the poor quality of the rally after point A. This was when the market was experiencing a substantial rally. This stock's failure to participate can be traced to its downtrend and relative weakness. Stock number three would be a good selection. Remember that it is in harmony with the market. If the probability of a rally in the market becomes very high, this stock should participate. What makes this stock especially attractive is its performance on the final reaction. The relative strength shown here is a good sign for the next rally. Stock number four presents a problem. If it really has broken the downtrend, it should participate well in the next rally. The problem is with the quality of the confirmation. As stated earlier, it is uncertain, and that provides us with our answer. Uncertainty is another word for doubt, which is always reason for doing nothing. There is not really enough time left on the tape to properly develop another idea, so we will move directly to the practice trading exercise. This time, it is very easy. This tape marks the end of the first set of 12 under this revised format. The end of next month, we will begin the next set. These tapes have the potential of being more useful than our earlier efforts, but that potential will only be realized if the topics fit the needs of the listeners. Your practice trading assignment this time is to give us some ideas on topics you would like to see covered in the coming year. Are there areas we have not covered? Are there things we should go over again or from a different perspective? Any thoughts that you would have would be appreciated and worked into a discussion at the earliest possible date.